of our dog tipper, of course, and Patrick Dittress's favorite free software picks. Live from the Tech TV studios in San Francisco, it's a brand new screen series. And I'm Kevin Rose. Thanks for joining us on the Screen Savers. This is the place to get your daily dose of technology. Mm -hmm. And we have a new show open. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I We're like all it. cartoony and stuff. Yeah. It's bizarre. Pretty Plus, cool. it's all people that are actually still on the show. Mm hmm. Oh, yes. a big plus. And this is going to be a fine show if you've heard of it. Flash Mob. We're going to tell you how to basically build your own supercomputer in a college. What do you call those things? Gymnasium. Dorm. Gymnasium. Bunch or of dorm. A or bunch a of people get together. Yeah. And just randomly if get together and build If you can download us, like, you know what? We, well, yeah. what? Well, let's show them. And I'm yeah. going to show you how to turn your Linksys router into a Linux intrusion detection system. That's so I overkill. kid you not. It's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing. It is. It's pretty cartoon-like. Dan? Dan. Yo. Oh, look at Dan's hair today. Yo. Look at that. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Can I Ladies say? love that. Touch the British pop stud. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what to say, guys. Look at you. What? what look at me. What? <laughs> it's like a hair, like a hairspray commercial gone bad or something. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like you're supposed to like sing a pop lyric, drop your guitar, and pass out drunk after flipping off the camera. It's beautiful, man. Yes, you're poor. Give me a beer. <laughs> Anyways, give me a call, <laughs> guys. Give me, the, give me a call. The phone number is 888-989-7879. Also, email us at the screensavers at techtv.com. Back to you, boys. Guaranteed his mom is going to call right now. <laughs> Danny, you need to get a haircut. She always says and that, And shave. Joe. And a shave. Yeah, that's right. He just shaved last week, we swear, ma'am. <laughs> start with the tech news that caught our eye today. Sarah yeah, has remember, a first Remember when start. Dan was just so young and had that short hair and was, like, bright-eyed? And now Innocent. he's, like, scruffy and angry and oh, rocker. Yeah. And... He's Alterna Dan now. <laughs> Alterna Dan. <laughs> That's right. Pretty cute. He'll always be our foo. Okay, on to the news. So, if you think San Francisco is a pretty wired city, in fact, perhaps not. The Bay Area was at the top of the list for this year's Intel Corporation's Most Unwired City Survey. Last year, Portland, Oregon held the title, but fell to number five this year. Some of the others in the top ten include Orange County, California, Washington, D.C., Austin, Texas, and Seattle, Washington. I'm wondering why the Bay Area and Orange County are counted as cities. Hmm. Well, it's Both funny. Not. It's like San Jose, the East Bay, and right. San Francisco. Last year, right, it was basically Portland through Vancouver, which is like saying the entire Northwest. Okay, the so Bay little... Area, we're talking Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I've done a little war driving, and I found hundreds and thousands of access points. Why are you hundreds not one of thousands? Well, uh, thousands of access points. <laughs> there are thousands and thousands of access points. But I'm just saying, like, why are we not considered one of the top wired cities? What's we are considered one of the top. Well, they're they, saying, they like, said we're not it's in the top It's very clever, five. right? Basically, Intel's like, oh, we're trying to sell Centrino, which is not ah. a processor. It's a combination of R80211B chips plus a processor so. plus a chipset. And they basically piggyback on this guy who does sort of quality of living surveys of mm -hmm. all the different regions in the United States. So is it based on the number of Centrino processor combos that they've shipped to this area? it's based on the amount of Wi-Fi that's available. They do a survey, and I think it may be based on who, who actually sends in a survey. I mean, it's kind of funny, right? We've got some guys that are doing some great stuff with making Wi-Fi available. They went up by Sutro Tower, and they're basically sort of sending Wi-Fi all over the you know, one side of the city. But like in my part of the city, out by the beach, there is no Wi-Fi. I'm there's up like there four too. houses, yeah. yeah. Like there's like your house and my house and like two other houses. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's a, It's Go San Francisco. I mean, Bay Area. That's right. <laughs> but, All right. Survey, yeah, really surveys sure. are weird anyway. Surveys are skewed. They are. Nobody, nobody's participating. All right. <laughs> if you don't like gambling ads, 
Good news. Yahoo and Google are saying by the end of April, both search engines are claiming they're going to stop running ads for online casinos, which is great if you don't like things that look like this. Of course, this comes as federal prosecutors are threatening action against American companies doing business with Internet casinos that are based abroad. Who cares? Who cares? The only time you're going to get a gambling ad on Google is if you do a search for gambling. If right. you type in motherboard, no gambling ads come up. You know, it's like, why does this really matter? I don't know. They, you know, they stopped advertising cigarettes in what 1970 on television. They they stopped advertising, yeah. you know, booze like hard liquor like decades ago. One of the things that I like about Google <laughs> is that they don't just place blanket ads everywhere. There's right. a lot of search engines that put advertising no matter what uh, search result you you type in. The cool thing about Google is if you know if you're looking for cigarettes or you're looking for gambling, yeah, oh, look. they're going to have ads related to it. Here we go. I can I can purchase. I can you well. Scan out I can, <laughs> no, let's not do that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pat's in sight, so he doesn't want you to see. Well, no, look, I can order drugs, right? CanadaPharmacy.com, <laughs> PillValue.com, WebSponder forward slash users forward slash drugs, right? So I can get discount overseas semi-legal prescriptions. What's something else illegal that people buy on the web? Um, uh, cigarettes? Duty-free cigarettes? Okay, wait, no advertisements there, although you get 42,000 listings. But look at that. Nobody's advertising. There's a market open on Google if they'll let you post it. I don't think they will. How about, let's see if the gambling ads are still up there. Yep. No deposit free gambling. What about wares? Looks like they're keeping pretty well. They won't let anything on wares. Or maybe nobody advertised. Xbox Mod? Xbox Mod? Mod chips? Those are. Mod chips? They're supposedly supposed to be illegal. And. What is it, Ken? We're going to go through everything on Google. Next story. Let's move right along. <laughs> Woo! Today's last story comes from a posting on the Irish Linux Users Group. One man's tale of tracking down and capturing a spammer slash spammer. Scammer slash spammer. Say that, that three times fast. In an internet cafe, it got interesting. The scammer slash spammer was physically cornered and attempted to eat his USB pen drive. <laughs> <laughs> This is the first incident I've heard of someone eating their USB drive. I don't know, guys. Fact or fiction? That is awesome. <laughs> that is so. Uh oh. Uh oh. If you do not destroy the memory chip inside, the data is still readable, even if they make you. I mean, if you, if you were cornered, are you going to put a eat a USB thumb drive? I mean, that's got to hurt coming out. <laughs> I'm, you just being, can, no, no, no. I'm just being Think honest. Where, it where, was was the guy when he, where was the guy when he got picked up? It was a pen drive. That makes it so much better. Right. <laughs> I mean, lift up a bar stool and drop it on it. Jump on it yeah. with your feet. Smash Flush it. it down the toilet. Light it on fire. But look, unless you break the case and break the chip that the actual memory is stored on, swallowing it, I yeah. mean, you could well, chew on it. Well, he was chewing it. on it. You have to read the, the story. said that they were trying to... They had him on the ground for about right. 10 minutes as he's like chewing on it, trying to pry his mouth open. So I wonder if he was, he was, he was <laughs> chewing on it because he was it. trying to break the chip oh, or because he was trying to swallow it. I don't know. Yeah, swallowing does not really hurt chips. <laughs> or, or just don't <sighs> spam people. Yes. <laughs> don't spam. That works too. You might be held down and forced to eat your pen drive. <laughs> That's all from me. Thank you very Move much, Sarah. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to put together the whole... <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Eat your uh, pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Dale joins us on the phone. Montgomery, yeah, Alabama. Here. Hey, Dale. Yeah, I'm here. What's the strangest thing that you've ever eaten? Regular food. What's Regular food. food. <laughs> What's, yeah. food? What's the strangest piece of technology that you've ever eaten? <laughs> Chewed on the Xbox controller. Oh, there you go. See? We know what that's like. Kind of strange, Dale, but what's your question? Uh, yeah, uh, I downloaded a movie from off the internet, and uh -huh. uh, the audio won't work for it. And Ooh. said I had to use the Divix, so I downloaded the free version, and it said that the audio wasn't working. Are you still using uh, Microsoft's uh, media player to play the file, or are you using the Divix player? No, I'm using the Divix. Okay. Okay. Well, he and has you all downloaded. The it's kind of funny. How long ago did you download? Did you download, re-download the Divix codec, right? So, for people who don't know, there's there's different formats you can basically encode or package or squeeze video and audio in. The the tools that are used to open those up or unpack them are codecs. So sometimes, if your player says, "Hey, I can't play this. I need this codec," you go to a particular website. In this case, Divix.com. Mm -hmm. You download it. Have you downloaded the latest update of the Divix codec? Uh, I tried to. It just it says it can't find this special codec or something. Hmm. Weird. It might not be encoded with Divix. Does it say, how did you know that the Divix was the codec that you needed? 
because it said I had to have DivX to play it. Uh, just out of curiosity, did you download this from, let's say, a legitimate site like iFilms or something like that, or is this something that you pulled off Kazaa or Kazaa? Kazaa? Well, yeah. just out of curiosity, what what type of uh, movie is it? Uh, it's uh, anime. Anime? Yeah. Mm. Well, the problem with that is that the guys that encode this stuff, right. uh, they're not doing it legitimately. They're probably not using the right tools. Right. You, know, you never know what you're getting when you download files like that. I mean, you, you could try using the QuickTime player. You can try using Windows Media Player. You can try using the DivX player. I mean, basically what, what you get to do now is, is kind of try everything. And sometimes, as weird as it sounds, using a different player i.e. one that's not supposed to recognize it, because um, some things look alike to the players, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you know, any kind of MPEG-4 it might think is, is trying to be the, uh, is trying to be the uh, DivX. I would try down using, just download two or three different players yeah, and try it in that and see whether any of them work on it. Exactly. There's a universal player called mPlayer that people use. Mm -hmm. And once this DivX codec is installed on your machine, it's important to know that it'll play on uh, Windows Media, the mPlayer, like right. any players that are installed on your machine, the, the codec goes into as well. So yeah. uh, that's kind of a, a tough one because there's there's nobody to call. When you download yeah. movies off the internet, that's what you get. Same go for songs or yeah, anything else. You can also you ask around if, if you downloaded it from a particular community because I know anime right. folks tend to stick together and pass stuff along to each other. You can say, hey, who used what to actually make this play back? Give it a shot, but try different players, even ones that aren't supposed to work, and try asking around online. It's about all you can do. There you go. Good luck. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just getting started. We've been looking through the Sunday circulars for some deals. We're going to share them with you a little bit later. And after the break, supercomputing in the hands of the people. We're going to talk to the organizer of a recent flash mob in San Francisco. Supercomputing on the fly when the screensavers continue. Supercomputers are just millions of dollars out of the reach of all of us in the hands of major research labs only, government secret labs in the NSA. Think again. If you and I and a bunch of our friends hook up our Motley PCs, we too can have our shot at a world-class supercomputer. They're calling it a flash mob, and here to show us how, Greg Benson, professor in computer science at the University of San Francisco. Welcome. Good to be here. I think I ask you, a flash mob, normally we think of like you know, marketing for Avril Lavigne and they, they SMS messages to 150,000 fans who descend on a mall in North Dakota. But you're using kind of a different interpretation of flash mob. Exactly. We're, we're capturing the spontaneity of the event that you just described, mm -hmm. but applying it to computing, actually to supercomputing, uh, something that you don't normally have access to. But if you get enough people together, you can build yourself a pretty decent supercomputer. What was the goal? I mean, like, supercomputers are now ranked, right? It's almost like chess players. And, and, and how do you, I mean, you, your goal was to actually get a top 50 supercomputer in the U.S. out of your flash mob. So we, what we're achieving is, to, what we achieved for this day, flash mm -hmm. mob one, we wanted to show that we could build something that could compete mm -hmm. with some of the most expensive, fastest computers in the world. And uh, and we did that. We came, we, we, we showed that we came close, and if, and if we would have been on the top 500 list two years ago with wow. what we achieved. So we actually we had some great video. You guys set this up at the gym at the University of San That's Francisco. Right. Basically, people brought in over 700 computers. About 900 people showed up, you said. And basically, you set up a giant network pulling all these computers together. Is that, right. is that the primary trick, pulling together the network? The, ne the network is key, and uh, we started setting that up uh, the day before. And that took about uh, 16 hours uh, setting up. Uh, hundreds of cables coming out of these network switches. Very cool. And the software you guys are actually running, we've got a copy of it up here. You're in San Francisco, Flash Mob 1, 2004, Instant Supercomputer. So this actually, this is kind of like, uh, it's not, it's loading into your memory. It's not replacing the operating system or rewriting your files in your hard drive or... Exactly, exactly. You you boot off the CD. It's a so-called live CD. So it's like Nopix or... It, exactly. So it, it boots up right into RAM, doesn't touch your hard drive, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you're ready to go. So we actually have sort of a mini flash mob set up here. That's right. So we've actually got four clients. So we can actually try to give any gigaflops. Is that how we're going to be rated we're, here? Yeah, yeah. So we've got our, let's see, we've got the clients installed over there. That's right. So so you, what you do to start a mini flash mm -hmm. mob is uh, you take, take a CD like the one you just showed, mm -hmm. put it into each of the computers that are involved, boot up a server first, mm -hmm. and then boot up the compute nodes after the server's booted, okay. and once the servers come up, then you can type in FM Taco. FM underscore Taco? FM underscore okay. Taco. 
Of course, we go searching for client flash nodes. I am a server on an isolated network, so it's detected four machines. Go yes. for it. Yeah. Hit enter. No. They're not going to explode on those guys, are they? <laughs> Hopefully not. Please no. Three nodes uh, are okay. Uh -oh. Nodes. uh oh. Uh oh. So try try typing it again. We yank one of our network cables. Yeah. Hmm. All right. We didn't touch anything. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. All the yeah. second nodes are keyed to this CD. We Banded got three it. okay nodes. One node's bad. This one was out. Okay. Yep. You can try it again. You can tell we're on the screensaver set because okay. things unplug themselves automatically. <laughs> Everyone just go taco. Enter. Print? Testing all four. Hey, all four nodes are okay. Hit all enter. right. So what are we going to do? Make a basic guess so of the processor type? So now it's going to go and see what processor types mm -hmm. everybody is, and uh, it configures each of the nodes based on what kind of processor is on that node. What does it do? to distribute a chunk of code for it to execute? or that, That's right. It? Each, each, each uh, compute node is going to do part of the, mm -hmm. the overall problem. Got it. So it's like giant parallel computing. That's exactly giant right. Giant cluster. That's exactly right. So hit enter to start LinPack with 20 megs per node. <laughs> Right. We ready? We're ready. So what shows up on the on the other systems while this is running? So so if you go to a compute node, what mm -hmm. you'll see on the screen is something very simple. It's, it shows what IP address it is. I see that up at the top. Um, it'll show CPU utilization. As long as that's over uh, about 50, it's showing that it's actually working on the computation. Uh, wow. It ran now, already. Uh, we're done. So if you come back to the server, we'll see that we achieved 1.49 gigaflops with the four machines here. Cool. Yeah. How long does something like that take to run when you have 700 machines trying to run simultaneously? Right. So uh, one of our runs uh, that we had with 256 machines on Saturday uh -huh. took a little over an hour to run. Okay. And if you were going to utilize all of them, you could run probably three hours to, wow. to finish the run. Is that because it takes a while for it to parse out all the information across all the systems? Or? Yeah, it's just, it's just uh, the way to think about it is you have more computers, you have more RAM, mm -hmm. and that means the problem that you can solve is bigger, and it just takes more time to solve bigger problems. So Gigaflops right now, it's pretty abstract. What's the future? We've seen distributed computing being used for SETI to solve cancer equations. What do you, do you hope to eventually be able to bring people together for a long weekend and like you know, cure cancer? Or? Well, maybe, maybe not cure it, but maybe make some <laughs> progress. The, 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 this is going to be a platform where uh, scientists can now write scientific code uh -huh. that people who are interested in that science can then provide a flash mob in order to run that. And so it gives ordinary people and scientists a new choice in which to run scientific applications. Very cool. What's going to happen? Are you going to evolve with a, another flash mob? Or flashmobcomputing.org is the website. Can we expect to see more evolution to this, more gatherings? We're going to, uh, we're going to improve the software, mm -hmm. make it even more automatic, and we hope that people take the software and uh, do future flash mobs, and we'll help them out with that. Very cool. Very cool. Greg. Thanks for joining us here Thank at the Screensavers. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to join a flash mob, pull one together in your garage, head over to thescreensavers.com and read what Greg has to say on how to make it all run. Very cool stuff, man. Ladies and gentlemen, still to come, Kevin has his greatest dark tip. Yeah, he's going to show you how to convert a Linksys router to a Linux intrusion detected. Detect, detect, oh boy, a Linux finger is up next. Plus, we're going to check out this week's Blue Plate specials. Tell me whether they're a real deal or a real scam. It's all coming up with the Screensavers. Continue. Linux intrusion detection system. Get to register for this week's Screensavers LAN party. Powered by NVIDIA. Yes, we're in our last week of Battlefield Vietnam. Grab your M16 and jump in a take. It's time to frag yourself a screensaver. And to top it off, mm -hmm. not only are we running the LAN party, we're also customizing and giving away our LAN party machines. Yeah. So listen up, you have two chances to win. First, simply register for our LAN party, you're automatically entered. And second, make sure to watch for our secret, secret code word during the LAN party on Thursday. You'll enter that in the website. That'll increase your odds even more. We'll be giving away one machine per week for the next three weeks, and you can enter each week. So go to our website and uh, click on Join Our Land Party to register. You must have the full version of Battlefield 1942 to play. And we'll Battlefield see you Vietnam. Battlefield Vietnam. I'm sorry. And we'll see you uh, this Thursday for the Screensavers Land Party. Those are cool machines. They're, They're nice going to etch our names and their laser and grave our names inside the machines. How cool is that? That's cool. It's even better for you because we don't get to keep them. That's right. They're well, we got nice. nice new machines. But they're not ours. We don't get to keep them That's either. True. Anyhow, it's time to tear our take on the latest newspaper tech mm -hmm. ads and the real deal. First up, Electronic Boutique. Trade in games or buy pre played games. Sounds like a great idea, right? It's over here. It's like Madden. I don't know if you can even see that at home. It's like Madden Football for $4.99. Whoops. Whoops. 
which sounds great until you realize it's Madden 2002 ah. for 4.99. So it's a little behind the times. Interesting idea, though. Recycling games. I suspect you might do better off trading them on eBay. I was saying nobody wants Madden in 2002. You never know. But send us an email if you actually if you have a great way to recycle games, resell games, or how you like to get them. And don't tell us to order them in or rent them and copy them to your Xbox and then take them back for yeah, rental. Okay. Kevin already knows about that one. Up next, check this out. 20% off all Belkin iPod accessories. That's cool. That's really cool, actually. They're the ones that have the battery pack. They've got the FM expander. But that's a pretty good deal. It's actually from Circuit City. Mm. We like that. Nice, cheap. Belkin items. makes some really good accessories for the iPod. Probably yeah. the best accessories, I would say, as so, far as the transmitters and the re recorders. Yeah. And, cool and the memory adapters. A lot yeah. of really good stuff there. Finally, check this out. We're looking at all these tax deals. For those of you who haven't done your taxes yet, and it looks like a really good deal. Twenty nine ninety five, ten dollars after rebate. Well, everybody's got the same prices. Every store we looked at, like Office Depot, CompUSA, all of them. And the only thing that differs in them is whether or not you can like get a free copy of uh, Norton Antivirus or Money Two Thousand and Four or Quick. And basic. So if you look around, there's a bunch of different deals depending on what you want to do. Of course, you got to front all the money and right. then do a mail-in receipt. What's really interesting is these prices mm -hmm. after you get the rebate are essentially the same prices you, you would pay to use the web-only version where you have access to the same basic program right. except it streams it over the web to your house. Now, I have to tell you, I, I used TurboTax. I right. bought it. I sent in the rebate and they sent it back within like two weeks. That's cool. So it's pretty cool. Sometimes you have to wait you know, three four months to get a rebate. They were really fast. We like no that problems about. there. That's always nice. It's highly unusual. What, too. what store was that? They can pick that up at. We actually have them all listed up on the website. It was like Office Depot, I think Comp USA, mm -hmm. and I cannot remember the third one off my head. But uh, oh, Office Max, Office Depot, and Comp USA. There we go. They all bleed together after a while. Good stuff, though. <laughs> Head over to screensavers.com. Quit laughing. And click on the show notes. It's like the same ad. You see our ad, and we took that along with our comments. Yeah, here's Sarah with a quick tip. I am not laughing at you. I am laughing with you. There you Always. Go. I would not <laughs> laugh at him. Let's hammer. Okay, from any folder in Windows XP, you can modify which, deta which details blah, you want to save. First, be in details view so you can see how it changes. See name, type, total size, free space comments. You just go to the view menu and click choose details. Now you have a little bit more control over which details you want to see. Add some, remove some, apply your changes, and you're done. Now don't go anywhere. Patrick has a handful of free software picks for you. They're good and they're Norton style. But after the break, Kevin shows you how to convert your Linksys router into a Linux powerhouse. It's all on the screensavers continue. I'm Kevin Rose. And I'm Patrick Norton. Coming up in this half hour, if you're looking for free stuff, I'm going to tell you about a bunch of my favorite classic software downloads for you. And we're going to tell our next caller, Jason, about all that's nifty and how to set up his own torrent files. That's cool. BitTorrent. Excellent. We but like now, it. now, Linksys routers right here. You've seen them all over Best Buy. Probably the most popular home router on the market. We love them. Great products. Yes. But what most people don't realize is that inside these devices runs embedded Linux. Cool. But the only thing is that the problem is that Linksys doesn't give you access to the Linux OS. So today we have a hack so that you can take full control. Uh-oh, Patrick has his hand in the air. I can say it now. You can make a Linux intrusion detection system. There you go. In your Linksys. Linksys Linux intrusion detection system, IDS. Now you've been practicing. Yes, I have. <laughs> this, is a, this is actually what happened is that every time uh, you write Linux into a device and you improve the code, you have to re-release it. It's open source. Right. So what happened it's part is... part of the, the, the GPL. Exactly, the source. GPL. And so they re-released the code and there was some, you know, little hackers that got into the code and said they found an exploit in the ping command that was built into it. Mm -hmm. So what they did is that they're starting to re-release firmware so that you can reflash this and expand the features that's built into your normal Linksys router. Cool. So, so let's said ping command or pin command? Ping command. Because okay. it built in, uh, for some reason, they have this little like ASP script. It's a ping mm -hmm. ASP script. And they found uh, a little exploit in there that allowed them to load files within... Ping uh, being like 192.168.2.1 exactly. and you know, exactly. 256 milliseconds, 11 milliseconds. So I send information and get it back. Exactly. And so they found... Uh, and they've been releasing these BIOSes. Let's, let's take a look at some of them right now. Let's get right into it. Uh, this right here is your standard Linksys uh, setup screen. Now, what's going to happen is the way you're going to uh, improve this and reflash the BIOS is if you go into here under, let's see here, uh, status here, we can see that 
look at the firmware version here. That does not say Linksys anymore. What we did is we <laughs> ran a little application that overwrote the BIOS, but kept everything intact and just added some functionality to it. So it's very easy to do. It's not like you have to hack anything or get into do any fancy commands. You just run update on the BIOS, mm -hmm. and it automatically just loads it in. You see a little process indicator go across the screen, and it's a done deal. But once you've done that, let me show you some of the cool things that it's added. Let's go into uh, administration here. And it's, it's added so many different features. I only have a few minutes here, so I can't go through them all. One of my favorite here, bandwidth management. <gasps> it allows you to manage the bandwidth so that you can only say, I only want to send so many kilobits uplink or downlink to certain ports or certain cool. subnets within my router. So could, could I route it so, like, say, you know, one of the children can only exactly. use a only certain Exactly. only take so much so that you get all the rest of the bandwidth. Isn't right. that awesome? That's cool. And then uh, take a look at this here. We have... Uh, Different things like you can enable cron, so you can have cron uh, services running. Um, Leo's let's, favorite Linux service. Indeed. Uh, let's take a look at some of the others here. Uh, SSH. I enabled the SSH server on here, and I actually generated uh, an open SSH or an SSH key here that um, using a, a PuTTY tool, and I was able to SSH create a secure shell so that I could connect to the router completely securely mm -hmm. so when I'm transferring files and doing things like that, there's no way of someone intercepting that traffic or getting my password. Cool. Also, uh, a little less secure. Talk to the router itself? Or does Just that to the router. router. Okay. From the client to the router. Got it. Uh, the other thing is, look at here, this is Telnet. I enabled Telnet on here, so that's ready to go. So what I'm going to do, since I already enabled Telnet, let's get into the Linux side of things. Oh, one other quick thing I wanted to show you though. Uh, this is really cool. One thing, uh, let me, it's going to take me a second to get here, so I don't want to, under the uh, advanced wireless settings, you can increase the transmit power of your router. Take a look at this here. Is the that default a good is, thing or a Well, bad it can thing? be. Uh, like you were saying before, we were talking about this earlier, you said that certain times when you increase the power too much, you can have little hiccups and strange things happen. It would be really sloppy. Uh, really sloppy. But the implementation that I've read here, uh, there was a guy that talked about how he had a wireless device that was upstairs that could not receive his broadband router. After he ran this patch, uh, patch he bumped it up to 84 here, hit applied changes, and he had um, almost a full signal upstairs where wow. he normally couldn't get it. That's cool. So that's pretty cool. The, your normal Linksys router, the new ones allow you to do that, but this one uh, does not. Let's go through the features real quick here. I'm going to go and I'm going to launch a um, command prompt. So let's go command here. Uh, let's go and do a nice clear screen. I'm going to go Telnet. Take a look at this here, 192.168.1.1. There I've connected right to the box. I'm logged in. I can do my standard LS and see all the directory structure there. Um, you can do so many different things. If you go into the www directory, you can see here that we have, this is all the files that you see, like the pages that you load. You can check them out, view them, do whatever you want to do. But what I did earlier is uh, I went into um, the t uh, temp directory because the temp directory is... Um, uh, whoops, where am I? PWD. Let's see where I am. I'm in root. CD. TM. Oh, I'm spelling temp. There we go. Okay, so I'm in the temp directory right now. I was used to Windows. And uh, if we take a look here, I downloaded Kismet. So if we go into Kismet, I use the wget command. You can go wget this command right here, and you can put in HTTP colon forward slash forward slash. I uh, put the files at the broken.org slash kismet slash. Let me just see where I put them here. Kismet. Uh, let's pull up this window here. Um, okay, kismet slash forward slash and, see, and forward then slash. kismet underscore drone dot conf. And we hit enter and see it download that file instantly. So you can pull any files that you want right into your Linksys router oh. using the wget command over the internet. Will that um, now show up in the in the HTML interface? Uh, no, it will not. That just uh, basically that just loaded it into the temp directory. So now what I can do is I can go real quick into the kismet directory here and go into the bin where the executables are and run dot forward slash kismet underscore drone and that's going to start right there if you take a look I just started the kismet service you can see I executed the command right here and uh, now I can launch a client and connect to it and anytime that someone connects to my Linksys router mm -hmm. I can view exactly what they're doing what types of information <laughs> that they're transferring over my router so this is a great way that you can keep on top of who's connecting to your Linksys especially if you don't have web enabled and you can also put Snort on here. There's a whole list of applications, links to the firmware, uh, Snort, Kismet, documentation, all my articles, screensavers.com. If you're not a Linux tweaker, should you run Linux on your Linksys router? You know, I would do the upgrade just because of all the extra functionality you get. You don't have to enable Telnet or SSH. Okay. You don't have to get to the command line level, but it does add, there's probably about 15 or so different things that I couldn't even touch on that uh, expanded functionality that you wouldn't normally get with a default uh, Linux router. Cool. So it's pretty cool, and they're always updating these BIOSes. Uh, it's a great community. There's message boards. There's everything. Definitely worth, worth checking out. Uh, screensavers.com for uh, all the links to download. And if you have any more dark tip ideas, I'd love to hear them. Email me, kevin at techtv.com, because that actually came from a viewer. 
and uh, it's Good really stuff. cool. Yeah, really cool stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, stay where you are. Kevin and I will reveal torrent file appreciation to our next caller. But up next, why pay for software when you get the equivalent for nothing? Let me tell you about my favorite free <laughs> software downloads. Coming up when the screen savers continue. So can you replace that with the original answer? Check in with the fine folks over at TechLog to see what's coming up tonight. Hello, boys. Hey, Jesse. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Okay, so I got a question for you. Life on Mars, maybe not now, but what about in the future? Because tonight on Tech Live, we check out a thing called terraforming. It's technology that could one day revive the red planet. My planet, the red planet. So stay tuned. That's coming up right after this. Terraforming. Terraforming. What is terraforming exactly? Is You're going to have to tune ah, in, buddy. Come on. You got me on that one. <laughs> okay, I'll see you guys later. Cool. Thanks, Jessica. Terraforming. Science fiction, science fact. Coming on Tech Live right <laughs> after this show. That's it. That's so now you got some free downloads now. Yes. Open source applications, free applications. Why would anybody want to pay mad cash, a hefty price, a ridiculous amount of money for an application when you can get a, 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 an identical or a similar or a much better functioning application for free? So yes. we put like 15 downloads or 12 downloads. I can't count today. So there could be nine. There could be 15 downloads on the website. We but. always get emails all the time saying, what, what do you guys run? What type of, what's your favorite software? This is Patrick Norton's absolute favorites. Yeah, this, first of all, first thing I download on any machine when I reconfigure it is Mozilla. Now, a lot of people want to know why I like Mozilla so much. One, it's more secure. It doesn't have a lot of the holes that we found in Internet Explorer. Two, tabbed browsing. Open link and new tab. Open link and new tab. Open link and new tab. What's that? So you actually create additional tabs rather than additional windows in there. And the idea being that you have this great way of exploring all the stuff that's going on in your system. Now, I like Firefox. Is there a reason you like Mozilla more than Firefox? Uh, it's a little bit, uh, I'll be honest with you, let me actually take everybody to Mozilla.org. What Kevin's talking about is a strip down. I actually love Firefox. We usually tell people to start out with Mozilla. Mm -hmm. Mozilla's at 1.6. Comes with a lot of things that it looks like Firefox does in the HTML identity yeah, and that stuff. Yeah, it's more like the full, you know, sort of Internet Explorer competitor. They're actually, they have a beta out. You probably shouldn't try a beta unless you're feeling kind of adventurous. But what Kevin's talking about is all the way down here if you want sort of the ultimate stripped down browser that only does browsing Firefox point eight they just changed the name uh, this is actually it's a solid fast unbelievably clean browser mm -hmm. all it does is browse and it does an amazing job love at the it. download manager too yes it's a very good thing next up would be uh, open office and we're gonna close all those tabs and we're gonna minimize these open office is essentially it's Word, and it's a presentation format. Or it, let me it's not Word, right? Word is a Microsoft product. But basically, you have the ability to create documents, and, you know, text documents, spreadsheets, all the stuff you would normally spend hundreds, if not zillions of dollars creating in Microsoft Office, office.org, download it free. I basically, I use, you know, Office on some of the systems I have at work because it's already donated. Every system in my house, right. we're running Office, uh, now, open Office. You can, you can also read Word documents and save Word documents in here yes. as well, right? And so that's kind of cool. You know, it's got the base thing. Is it an exact Office clone? No, but you know what? 90% of the people never use 90% of the features in Office, and I think most of them are in here anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, you've got the classic slide layouts and demos. It's all good, basic, clean stuff. Finally, this is like the best software nobody's ever heard of, dbpoweramp.com. I've never heard of it. Nobody's heard of this. I actually found this. There's a program they have. I'm going to scroll down here. And there it is, Sveta Portable Audio. And I found this when Diamond stopped supporting my portable player. Check this out. This is basically a, a program they have that does nothing but transfer music on the portable players. iPod, Arco's Jukebox, Best Data, Compact Creative Labs. There's all the Diamond stuff that's not supported anymore because the company's gone. Ton and ton of stuff. So it's all these amazing download and support for all these systems that aren't used anymore. So that's going to allow you to transfer songs back and forth from my iPod, things like that. So I can actually pull songs off because we get a lot of callers that always want to take music off their iPod. Can you do it with that well, software? Well, no, that, that's still basically fundamentally, that, that's a dark tip and we'll talk about that All in right. another day. That'll be my dark tip All for right. you. The other thing they have is DB uh, Power Amp Music Converter which can rip, but the thing it does that's really cool is they have an amazing page with every codec you've ever wanted to play with, whether you're talking about Obvorbis or Monkey's Audio Codec or a ton of individual stuff I can load onto there. And they've got a great tool that's basically designed just to pull stuff off of your tape and or record albums. Really, really, really good software. Works really, really, really well. And it's really, really free. I've got 
free antivirus. I've got the two free, you know what, go to screensavers.com, check out the free software links, and start downloading and stop paying cash for perfectly good software you can get for nothing. Excellent. Now, coming up after the break, if you're like our next caller, Jason, and have questions about using torrent files, then stick around. We're going to help you out right after these messages. Catch tomorrow's show. Find out which HDTV plasma monitors, Tech TV Labs, top choice. And Bert Monroy teaches you all about alpha channels in Photoshop. Plus, Sarah shares with you some of her favorite free alternative window shells. Make windows your very own all on tomorrow's show. Jason joins us on the phone from Fairfield, Iowa. Hey, Jason. Hi. Hey. How are you? Very good. How about you, Kevin and Patrick? We're Excellent. doing great. Uh, what can we help you out with? Uh, I was wanting to know uh, about torrent files and how to use them, like upload them to website, maybe my website, and see them. Do you have like a video you want to share or something? Well, I'm into video editing and making home videos, and cool. I'm wanting to like upload my video to a website, kind of like with uh, Kevin's website, The Broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you, you probably you were like the premier BitTorrent user. Well, the reason that I uh, let me explain to you what happened basically is on the broken.org, what I had is I had movies available for download. Mm -hmm. There were 100 megabytes each, 100 and some odd That's megabytes. A big file. That's a big file. And when I got picked up on Slashdot, um, let's just say my dot 30, 40 <laughs> seconds later, my dot Mac account was not too happy about that because that's where I was hosting the files. Apple sent me a nasty email saying that you know you violated your terms of service, you've used too much of our bandwidth, you're pulling down our network. So what I had to do is use something called BitTorrent. And BitTorrent, for the people at home that don't know what that is, is it's a way for you to take that file and uh, shrink it down to it. Well, you're not really shrinking it down. You're creating a tor dot torrent file, mm -hmm. and so that when everyone downloads it, let's say you're going to download, I'm going right. to download it, Sarah's going to download it. We're all sharing with each other. Sarah gives me a piece of the file. I give you a piece of the file. So rather than hit the server and drop my server to nothing, right. it's going to share it around the multiple users. So you're not so using up like all your bandwidth. It's almost like one person downloading it who happens to be 300,000 people exactly. instead of 300,000 people hitting on your very expensive bandwidth simultaneously. At one point there was 10,000 people connected to the torrent, Ouch. all sharing with each other, which was cool. It was better than taking down my web server. Yeah. So it's a new way for people to distribute things that are big in file size. It's Linux like, ISO images are starting to be distributed through torrents. It's like peer-to-peer -peer without a client? Exactly. Well, okay. it's peer-to-peer it's -peer until you close the window. So if okay. you're downloading it, you're sharing with other people. The second you close your download window is the second you stop sharing with anyone. So just think of it that way. There's a bunch of different sites. What you have to do, let's walk you through it real quick here, is you have to download something from BitTorrent. There's an official BitTorrent site, uh, which is bitconjure.org slash BitTorrent. You can go to Google, type in BitTorrent. It's the first link that will come up if you don't have that URL. Um, you click on the download link there, and they're going to say two things here. You're going to need the Windows installer, mm -hmm. which is right here. That will give you the client that you need. So if you ever want to download torrent files, it's really easy to install. There's no setup to it. And if you want to create torrent files, you need something here called Complete Directory. It says for Cedars to create .torrent files. So that's what you want. Which, once you install that, you're going to get something like this. Here's the BitTorrent Complete Directory 1.0.1. It's very easy. All you have to do is choose the file that you want to add. So you would choose a file. Uh, let's pick a, a file here. Let's do autoexec.bat for the heck of it. And then the announce URL. Now, the second part of BitTorrent is that you need a tracker. Mm -hmm. A tracker is a server that is running that keeps track of all the people that are connected to your torrent file. So that when you connect to my you torrent file... You need part file, 67. You need part 33. You exactly. need part 22. You've got part 33. You've it's the got, traffic director, basically. It. It's, it's updating the torrent file and saying that here's who you need to connect to. It's basically passing the information around. And once you do that, so you're going to need a tracker. If you don't have a tracker or you don't have the means to create a tracker, there's instructions on how you can set them up in, in Linux. It's pretty straightforward. Cool. But if you don't have the means to do that, there are some public trackers that you can find out there that you can just upload your torrent to, and then they will track it for you. Nice. Uh, once you do that, it's going to create the .torrent file. It's a tiny little file. It's going to be like 10 or 12K, something really small. You put that on your website so that people can download that. And they're going to click on that, and it's going to uh, automatically launch BitTorrent, as long as you have your web server configured properly. Mm -hmm. And then the second it does that, it's going to show you who's downloading it. Let me just give you an example here. I will go to uh, my website real quick, thebroken.org, and I'm going to click on one of the torrents here, let's say the first release, .torrent. And it's going to launch BitTorrent and say, where would you like to save this AVI file? I'm going to say to the desktop because it's a video. And then there you can see 
This is actually BitTorrent running right now. It's going to it's going to start downloading the file right now. You can see how many people that you're connected to, your sharing rate. Here's your sharing rate, who you're sharing with. Uh, I'm connected to two peers, and that's going to grow as we continue. Seven seeds are sharing. So, and then I'll start uploading to other people. People will start downloading from me, and uh, it'll take a little while to download, but once it does, uh, you'll have the completed file. So, to recap real quick, all you have to do is run that complete directory and find a website that will host your, or track your torrent for you. Okay. There's two websites I recommend. Track your seed. Uh, yeah, track, exactly. There's two, there's two uh, sites I recommend. Torrents.com. T O R R E N T Z Z dot com, Torrance dot com. I really like, and also another one is Supernova. It's S U P R Nova dot org. It's a cool. couple funky URLs. We'll put the links in the show notes. Now, just to let you know, on these two sites, there is some illegal stuff on there as far as movies. People trade right. movies, just like any P two P network. Just be careful what you're downloading. Um, but they're fun sites to check out, and they allow you to upload torrent files and things like that. So That's you can awesome. share your video with whoever you want. I've said enough. It's good stuff, man. Thank you. Good question. Yes, very good question. Thanks for the call. Let's check in with Dan for a helpful tip. Thank you, fellas. Keeping your PC from harm these days is getting kind of tough, but there are basic solutions that will keep you protected. So go to thescreensavers.com slash show notes and read our article on the top 10 methods to fight malware. It ranges from the basic firewall suggestion to also keeping an internet-only credit card. But stay where you are because next up, check in our inbox to see what's on your mind. What are you doing? But the screen service continues. It's that time again. Sarah, do you have any emails? I've got tons of email. Boy, we've got a good audience today. Good clapping. They were trained well. Okay, Iron Chef, that's his name, wants to know. I have a brand new computer. Came with a GeForce FX 5200 video card. I'm interested in Doom 3. I'm wondering what would be a good card to buy. I played Far Cry with a 5200, and I highly doubt it'll handle Doom 3. Mm, you're probably highly right. So 5200, it's, it's a nice economy gaming card. Doom 3 is supposed to be, the, the, it's basically the, from the people who bought you Quake and Wolfenstein and everything else that's good and nasty in first-person shooters, Doom 3 is going to be the next great, big, amazing game, and it's probably going to kill everything that thinks it's a high-end system right now. I would say wait for Doom 3 to actually ship. Yeah, find out which video exactly. cards are giving you the best frame rates, because they'll have benchmarks the second something like that ships. Right. They'll start telling us which are the best cards to buy for that particular game. Far Cry, a great game. Go buy it, seriously. Very game. scary AI he, in that game. Oh, it's awesome. But yeah, you could buy a really fast graphics card now, but by the time Doom 3, Doom 3 ships in six months, if it even ships in six months, the worst case scenario is that it ships like a year from now, and then you're going to want to buy two graphics cards. Just wait for Doom 3 to ship, mm -hmm. and then we'll tell you what the fastest card is. Cool. Yeah. Okay, Rob says, since the demise of DVD-X copy, I'm looking for something similar. What do you guys recommend for good uh, DVD burning software packages? Yeah, DVD decryptor is great. We had that as a dark tip a while back. Matter of fact, there's a, you have an entire article. It's nothing right. about backing up your DVDs for free. Yeah, there's a couple tools, and believe it or not, it's really easy. They're actually easier than DVD-X copy, I think. Mm -hmm. DVD shrink is another great one as well. DVD decryptor and DVD shrink, they're both awesome, yeah. they're free. It's like, why spend the hundred bucks? And it, definitely not Well, DVD X copy was kind of like hampered by one, having to make it really hard to do anything other than back it up to a DVD, and two, they had all those legal fights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so those are free tools, and you, we'll put a link to them in the show notes. We should put the article up in yeah, the show notes. Yeah, definitely. Tech screensavers.com slash show notes, I believe. Yeah. That's it. That's it for this edition of the Screensavers. I'm Kevin Rose. And I'm Patrick Norton. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to thank our guest, Greg Benson. And we'll see you next time. Have a good night.